talking about integrity and how it affects our bhakti and I wanted to propose a question to all of you that we could discuss. The question is, you have certain moral principles and one of the things that's discussed in the subject of integrity is honesty. So we have been discussing about self-honesty, like deceiving our own self, and how that obviously is a problem, because if you deceive yourself, you have a problem and you don't even know you have it. And it's like having a cancer, but you don't know you have it, so you don't do anything. So you have to know that you have a disease to do something, correct? Yeah. So then a question came up that I was thinking about for today's class, yeah, is how does honesty in dealing with others, including dealing with people in general, affect our bhakti? Does it affect it or does it not affect it? Does it even matter? If I tell a lie, does that have any effect on my bhakti? Or does it have no effect because it's only, you could say, a mundane principle or a moralistic principle that we should be honest. But if I'm not, let's say I do business, I'm not honest, does that really matter? I get a position in a company, the way I got it, I wasn't so honest, but now I'm making money, supporting my family. Does that have any effect on my bhakti? Or is it completely distinct? So, that's the question. Then we have an answer, at least a little bit of an answer. This is from Chaitanya Shikshamrita by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. This is one of the books Prabhupada said we should read. Do you know that? This and Jaiva Dharma. So, he addresses, there's a whole section in this book which is kind of interesting. He addresses activities that in some cases you might not think have any effect on bhakti, but they have effect on bhakti. So, he addresses honesty. I just have to find the page. Give me a minute. Actually, why don't we ask you the question before we read? What we need, I've just put out the question. So would someone like to offer an answer? Yes. Why, how? Okay. And, uh, and it's the last thing of Dharma that's there. So I think it's if, if we the Truthfulness is the last thing of Dharma. Yeah. Okay. And it's way so it it's weighs on you. It weighs on you. Yeah. And then that distracts you. Yeah, and when you even if you say like, you know, people have these white lines. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's whatever we get from the internet. Um, 
Right, definitely with devotees we could we can say yeah we because dealings with devotees should be pure. Well, what about just some guy in the street? Well, that can be time, place, and circumstances. But we're telling the truth because too much more mental distress and actually just get. <laughs> if you tell someone too much truth, they'll get distressed. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, that's true. You know, it's like how relevant is it if it's a complete mundane topic and a mundane, you know, if, if you know you give someone. All right. Well, let me ask you a question. You're rushing to do something. Mm -hmm. You're walking down Oxford Street. You're rushing. You're late for a program. And someone says, could you explain how I get to so and such, such and such place? And you know how to get to such and such place. But you're late. You just say, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not from around here. I don't know. And then you run off. Does that have any effect on your bhakti? I would tell them, but very quickly. No, but I'm saying you didn't tell them. Oh, you didn't tell them. Is that, that's, that, in other words, if we're dishonest with devotees, obviously that could disturb a relationship with the, with the devotee. And that is disturbing to our bhakti. Right, if you address it to the devotee, then it would be disturbing to his impression on the future. He doesn't know that you don't know. Okay. But it does, um, well. aside from him, would it, matter, would it have any bearing on my devotional service? I just said, I'm sorry, I don't know. Because I just want to get to the program, and it would take me like three minutes to explain it to him, and I'm already ten minutes late. Well, it would do. Well, it would do to me, because we don't know whoever Krishna is. Krishna's looking at how we're responding. So whether someone's a devotee or not, they're still... But your motive is just to go hear the lecture. So it seems like it's pretty pure. <laughs> it was the, I've been in situations where I did okay, the so, and felt really so, bad. So um, what she's saying is that it would affect her, and I accept that. Mm -hmm. Now I'm asking a philosophical question. Okay. No, it would affect you, and because it affected you, it will affect your bhakti, because now your mind's disturbed, and you feel... But if it didn't affect you, okay. consciously, would it affect your bhakti? That's a question. Which could, I don't, yes, you have an answer? Um, Prabhu, as far as I understand, there's no material impediment to devotional service. No material impediment, okay. Uh, but then, many times, the lies are spoken with greed in the background. So, so it depends. Is, so you're saying it depends why you're lying. Yes, the motivation matters. Yeah. So if, uh, <laughs> then it would be fanning the greed further, and then fanning the greed means more material. So if, if the lying directly affects our consciousness, well, which in her case it did, but in your in this case you're saying that if I'm lying in order to advance my material life, then I'm becoming more entangled. So that's directly affecting. Okay. Then my question is again, yes? I was thinking that um, it's like the fire always burns, whether you want, whether you know lies or not. In the same way, whether you're conscious or unconscious, when you tell a lie, then it will get a, an effect maybe in the future. And then Krishna will remind you of that case where you didn't know that there was this proper, what was proper thing to do, but you actually saw it. So, whether you're aware of it or not, you, you'll get affected by it in some way. Okay. Um, this came up during Prabhupada's time because some devotees were able to distribute more books by exaggerating. Exaggerating the truth. So... Well, sometimes they did more than exaggerate the truth. <laughs> they just said whatever they had to say to sell the book. And we talked about that last week. And this was of concern to some devotees. And there were two things that Prabhupada considered. In all our preaching, he always considered the effect it has on the devotee 
and the effect it has on the person you're preaching to. Or is, is the program, is what you're doing going to be conducive to making people Krishna conscious? And is it going to be conducive for you becoming Krishna conscious? So one answer which you gave, and I think you gave also, is if I'm doing it and I'm conscious that's having an ill effect on me, then the answer is yes, lying is lying or exaggerating the truth would be bad, even using your example, even if it was only done for a benevolent reason. Like, it, I was just, I needed to get to this program, so I just told a person I don't know. Or, the example Prabhupada gave is you tell your child, if you take this medicine, I'll give you candy. Then they take the medicine and you don't give them the candy. <laughs> because that's the only way they're going to take the medicine. So that lying was in their interest and you did it out of love. So, so then we have the example. Krishna asked Yudhisthira Maharaj to lie and he didn't want to lie. And that was a fault because Krishna asked. But when Prabhupada was informed that some devotees were not very truthful in book distribution then he said I never I distributed books you may not know but when Prabhupada came out with his Bhagavatams he was going out himself distributing well he distributed back to God and end Bhagavatams he distributed um, Bhagavatams on the boat so he was always showing people the books and he said I never had to lie so why are you lying so he wasn't happy about that at the same time, we have this example of Yudhisthira. When Krishna saw that there was a higher purpose, he said, you should say Asutama is dead because that would cause, who was it? No, who was the father of, of Asutama? Drona. Then Drona wouldn't, Drona wouldn't fight. He, you know, he, his son was named Asutama, but there was an elephant. But Krishna just said, tell him Asutama is dead. So Yudhisthira couldn't lie, so he said, Aswatama, the elephant, is dead. So of course Drona didn't hear the elephant. But, so that was an example, like you give the example, you can sacrifice a person to save a village, sacrifice a village to save a state, sacrifice a state to save a country. But the problem is, and this is where I wanted to bring the discussion to, the problem is, when you're dealing with fire and you're not careful, you can get burned. So when this, this question came up several times with Prabhupada, and he, he gave an example you might have heard, catch the fish without getting caught, catch a big fish without getting wet. So we were distributing books, we were exaggerating, and we were getting very wet. It was affecting us and it was affecting people. I thought, you said this book was about this. This is a religious book. And they were upset. because We said it was about something else. So, then Prabhupada, he said, if you describe Krishna, and he said, this is how you should describe the book. He said, just describe Krishna. And you can exaggerate as much as you want about Krishna and it will always be true. So even if you lie about Krishna, Krishna is unlimited, so you can't lie about him because he can do anything and be anything. So he was kind of sh saying, not kind of saying, that there's an art to presenting things in a way to attract people. Now sometimes when Prabhupada was interviewed, he'd say, well, how many temples do you have? And he'd say, we have a hundred. And we didn't have a hundred. Or we have a hundred people in every temple. I was in a temple, there are only four. Or eight, or twelve. So Prabhupada was giving an impression the movement was very powerful. Or, or you could say he was explaining what it's going to be like five years from now, or he could see that. So, I don't think Prabhupada saw that as lying, it's just, you know, 
PR, you know, I mean, Trump got elected, you know, so that's called PR, right? So, but in general, I just want to give my observation. Um, in general, what I saw is if devotees weren't truthful on Sankirtan and they were out six or eight hours a day, that tended to come back in their life off of Sankirtan. They were so used to exaggerating truth that it kind of became an unconscious habit. So uh, the second thing we saw was that devotees tended to rely on saying things which weren't completely truthful to sell a book, and they never learned how to sell the book by preaching. And so when Prabhupada was dealing with this issue, he said that if you're expert, you can sell it by preaching. And then later on, he said, if you're a Brahmin, you'll sell it by preaching. If you're a Vaisha, you won't sell it by preaching. You'll just talk to the person and make small talk and say whatever you have to say to sell it. So he was definitely emphasizing preaching. And then, um, and then he said, if, he said, you're supposed to be Brahmins, so people will see you and they'll think you're religious people and you're lying. That's just not going to, it's going to ruin, it's going to, could create a big problem for us. Because if we're not honest, that's kind of a trademark for us, honesty. And if we're not honest, it's going to have a bad effect. And my personal feeling, my personal observation is that when you, you know, we have a saying in America, in English, give them an inch and they'll take a mile. So you just, you know, it's like eat one potato chip, you'll eat the whole bag, right? So if you, if you give, if you say some, well, it's okay, you know, just exaggerate a little, it's all right. And how do you distinguish? Where do you draw the line? So Prabhupada said, that's, you know, sometimes you may have to, to say, to lie, to protect somebody. Do you know where this person is? No, I don't. Right? The Nazis are coming. You're not going to tell them. Right? You're going to do what you can to protect them. Then we have the principle that Brahm Brahminical qualification is honesty. And I think that's probably the strongest argument of how it would affect us. If we want to be Brahminical, that's one of the qualifications. Cleanliness. It's like, it's like I could ask you the question, can you be Krishna conscious and not be clean? Does it have anything to do with it? And in one sense you could say, it doesn't matter. It's based on your inner purity and your chanting of Hare Krishna, which, which obviously you would say, well, if your purity is inner, it would show up outwards. So cleanliness is Brahminical quality. Right? Socham, satyam, and truthfulness. So. <clears throat> you wanted to say something? Yeah. And I then thought that if, if you was in a rush for the program, then it's not to do it based on what you're saying to the devotee, it's about how you deal with the person or the, or the person in the street. So if you just say, hey, Krishna, I have an appointment to get to. So you're, you're touching base with that person's soul, so you're not committing offence on the relationship level, but you can just excuse that you don't have time to stop. You yeah. don't have to lie, but you could, you know? Yeah. So I know where it is, but I don't have time to tell you. Hare Krishna. You, know, <laughs> you, know, you can just, you don't have to say you don't know where it is. <laughs> like you could say, I'm sorry. I'm I'm, a, I'm really late, Hare Krishna. Yeah. It's over so. there. <laughs> um, that's a different issue, though. That's a yeah, relationship, relationship issue. Um, he, illicit sex, intoxication, gambling, meat eating definitely affect the quality of our bhakti. In and of themselves, they're not bhakti, but they affect it. So obviously there are things that affect it. I'm going to read what Bhakti Thakur said about lying. 
Falsehood consists of verbal lies, cheating religion, cheating conduct, and prejudice. Lying is forbidden, and to tell a lie under oath is more serious. When Bhishma Day was instructing Yudhishthira, he listed nine or ten items which were considered civilized. This is how you would define a human being, and lying was one of them, not to tell a lie. It was kind of interesting. He was making a demarcation. Here's human life. If you do these things, you're human. If you don't do them, you're not human. So one was lying. So, of course, we can say on the transcendental platform that may be necessary or may be done in service. But this is on the, the material platform, the general platform, mostly what we're dealing with, that it is uh, considered subhuman. Now, I read, uh, I read a little survey that teenagers, 20% of what they tell their parents are lies about where they went, what they did, what they're going to do, and what they're doing now, if it's on the phone. 20% of what they tell their parents are lies. And it's, a, it's quite interesting. There's a lot of statistics. I think amongst adults, it's about one out of, twi- one out of 10 or one out of 20, one out of 11, I think it was. I can't remember exactly. But that's almost 10% of what you say, what adults, average adult says. Even if, it's, even if it's one out of 20, that's 5%. That's a lot. Because we say, how many things do we say a day? Groups of 20 don't take very long. Out of every 20 things, one's a lie. That's amazing. So, as we're saying, truthfulness is diminishing, and it shows up in these surveys. You, if you want to find out more, you can Google this. It's quite amazing um, how much we lie for various reasons. When can you? Yeah, I've, I've saved somebody's life, yeah. for sure. Uh, husband can lie about the beauty of the wife. <laughs> I know that. Maybe it's the mom. There's always, there's always, you know, exceptions. You know, there's things you could, yeah. There's things you can do when you want to get married to somebody. I think you can. I was reading. I forget what they are. And uh, two more. The, okay. Um, the, the, problem, the problem that I see is that, or the problem that we had and we could potentially have, is that we felt that as devotees, if we engage everything in Krishna's service, nothing is sinful, no matter what you do, because it's purified. And so that even led on rare occasions for devotees to do dishonest things in the service of Krishna. So the question is then, it develops a certain mentality that is, I'm a devotee, so because I'm a devotee and I'm doing it for Krishna, then it's okay. But the fact is, there are a lot of things we did that weren't okay although we did them for Krishna. And Prabhupada was upset about them. There were other things that weren't okay that we did for Krishna that he wasn't upset about, but to distinguish became difficult because the general feeling amongst devotees was once you're a devotee, everything's okay, practically. You know, then, you know, listen to this one. You won't believe this. But our women were going out on Sankirtan and they even had the idea of prostituting themselves because they could make more money. And you know in Vedic times there are prostitutes who are devotees. So why not do that? Like so where do you, it's like where do you draw the line? I mean I would use the money for Krishna. We could print more books. And I'm not doing it because I want to. I'm doing it in service. So you know. Then we had, you know, then apply that to stealing, apply that. You know, I could raise money by selling drugs, but just because I used to sell drugs 
before I was a devotee, I know the market, I know where to do it. And no, but it's not related to sports principles. So yeah, it's related to the four principles. You know. Yes. But still, these questions came up. Because these questions came to Prabhupada. Can we take money if we know the money was acquired illegally? So it means we were, weren't clear. Because it's going to be used for Krishna. And Prabhupada said no. Yes? Yeah. That was part of it. I, <clears throat> that was definitely part of it. For the individual, how it affected the individual That he was definitely concerned with that. But I think this this brings up another topic because I'm just speaking from being on the ground in those years and watching it. Because I was a Sankirtan leader practically. The whole time Prabhupada was here, that's what I was doing. And so, as someone distributing books and someone in charge of book distribution, you see how things are affecting, how devotees are getting affected. Let me tell you a story. It's a very interesting story. The, I told this story before, but I don't know if you, very few people would know this, but devotees in their distribution of books kind of felt pretty much invincible in, in the sense that anything goes, anything within reason. You know, if I can extract a large amount of money by exaggerating a little something. Whatever, you know, some stuff, I could do something and distribute more books, then I'll do it if I could say something that maybe not Directly related to the book, but indirectly related, but something that would in, attract people. And out of fear that if I actually told them too much about the book, they just wouldn't want to take it. So that kind of became, I don't want to say everyone was doing it, but a little bit of that was going on. Everybody used it a little bit. It be, kind of became the norm, or most devotees. Something like that, you know, something which which we may not consider completely straightforward or completely honest. And so, th then there was this mass murder in Guyana of a cult, and it was a huge thing. I don't know when it was, 1979 maybe. It's a huge thing. It was all over the newspapers that like 50 or 60 people they drank cyanide. Kool-Aid with poison, and they all killed themselves. Huge, huge, huge thing. That was the first time that ever happened. So all the papers in America, probably all over the world, were now completely down on cults. And cult is defined as by the media as a new religion. So we were now considered a cult. Cults are dangerous, and cults brainwash people because otherwise if these people weren't brainwashed they wouldn't kill themselves. So now we're trying to go out on book distribution and everywhere in the media all people are hearing about is cults. And as soon as you go out and say, excuse me sir. No, they'd stop and as soon as they see the book they're just, oh you're a cult, get away. It was like amazing, like amazingly difficult. So one of the leading book distributors in America, he realized <clears throat> at this point the only way he could distribute a book was to preach so that the people would know what he's really teaching because they have their idea, cult, brainwashed, etc., etc. So if he preaches to them, then they'll understand. No, this, we believe in God, we believe in devotion like that. 
So he said, I could not distribute a book unless I preached. Because otherwise, if I just said, here's a little book about peace of mind, and Mahatma Gandhi read it, and said, oh, you're a cult. It was like, so he had to get in information. And he said, because of that, Krishna kind of made that arrangement and forced him to distribute books purely on the basis of what was in the book. And then people were taking the books. And there was this transition of book distribution from means that were a little less direct to much more direct means. That we were selling books more by preaching. <clears throat> so I think Prabhupada understood that all along, that we could do that, but, but we didn't know how, or we didn't have the faith. And he, he would say, Prabhupada said, that is, that we're, he said, you can sell it by preaching, but you're not expert enough to do it. There's a letter like that. So I think that Prabhupada understood that we're, we're going to distribute books the way we have to, and he let us. But at the same time, he said, this is the best way to do it. And we could, but the books were going out, and that was important. And I think he also realized that it would be a self-correcting process. Now, a lot of times things weren't brought up to Prabhupada, so things could get off track. And it would be when a devotee would come and bring it up to Prabhupada, then he would make opinion. Don't do it this way, don't do it that way. So I personally saw, as a Sankirtan leader, the more the devotees were preaching, the happier they were. Then we went through this phase where book distribution started declining and it was necessary to raise money, so the book distributors were now engaged in raising money, selling things. And they were very miserable. That was a very miserable period. So as a Sangerton leader, I was concerned that the devotees would become purified by the Sangerton. In this case, they were becoming contaminated by it. And they were telling people whatever they had to tell people to get donations. And it was having a very bad effect on them. So yes, Prabhupada was concerned how it affected us, for sure. And one of the things we did see over the years is that there were devotees who were so capable and so intelligent they just knew how to preach to people in a way that people would take books. They just had this knack. They learned how to do it. And they were more rare. And Girashwami tells a story that um, one devotee who was more of a businessman, when he was to make life members, he would tell life members, you'll get this, you'll get that, you'll get this, you'll get that. And half of what he said they weren't going to get. And then Giraj Maharaj is more of a Brahmin, so he would preach, you know, we're teaching Bhagavad Gita. This is what Bhagavad Gita says, that you should support Brahmins. And so he would preach. So that's, that was his nature. That's how he did it, Brahminical nature. So he made life members by preaching. The Vaishya made life members by marketing. So I think that's an interesting point. But there's a letter you can find it, and Prabhupada said, I never sold books by lying. It's there. He said, if you just describe Krishna, people will be attracted. He said, but it's an art, how to do it. If you learn that art, then you can do it. And that, that was always the best way for the devotees. They were the most happy doing that. Another thing I also found, this is a really interesting, that the more direct the approach, the more response we would get. Because the more direct the approach, then if a person got the book, they were generally interested. Where if, you, if they thought some, the book was about something that wasn't, then when they got the book, they were, they were less likely to read it. So we, we were somehow meeting more interested people by speaking more about the books. And then the response was better. Yes? Yeah. So it's pleasing to the person yeah. who speaks. 
so you're speaking about Krishna, then some devotees were getting burned out on book distribution. And so that got back to Prabhupada. The devotees are getting burned out on book distribution, which sounds like book distribution is the cause of getting burned out. And Prabhupada said, book distribution is not the cause of getting burned out, but how you do it is burning you out. More or less he said that. He said, what, so, like you say, I particularly remember the day we got this letter, or the day after we got this letter, where Prabhupada said, I never had to lie, I just told the truth. And when we got that letter, it was like, that's it, okay, this is what Prabhupada wants, we're, we're just going to preach. And I remember that day in my mind, this was 40 years ago. It's actually 42 years ago. I remember it. I remember where I went that day on Sankirtan. And I remember how I feel. Isn't that amazing? It was such a drastic difference of how blissful it was just to preach all day about the books. But then I remember coming home from Sankirtan. It was, it was a two-hour drive. I remember coming home. I was like in another planet. Because I'd been preaching all day instead of saying, here's a little book, you know, helping kids, you know, it's about peace of mind, give a donation. It was a different experience. <clears throat> so Prabhupada uh, noted that. And then Prabhupada said something else which is very interesting. He said book distribution is the real intoxication. Or he said book distribution is intoxication. I don't know if he said real, but he said it's intoxication. And devotees were, getting, were actually getting intoxicated by it. That if you did it in the right way. And when devotees were doing it the other way, many of them were burning out. They couldn't do it. It just didn't feel right to them. It didn't feel congruent with what it meant to be a devotee. But when we did it properly, then um, it was an amazingly blissful experience. Yes? In the context of that famous quote by Prabhupada, where he said, what's the use of your two minutes of preaching? It's just getting close. The, co the context of that was, I think, some devotees were going out and they would, you know, like spend like 20 minutes with somebody and then the person wouldn't take a book. And so that, you know, that debate, you know, like when we're out there, should we spend a lot of time with people talking or just... That quote can throw the thing, can throw it off balance. Because a lot of people we met became devotees. And so what, hap what was happening was when you were out, you know, sometimes you're out distributing books, you're just meeting people, nobody's that interested, but if you're a good book distributor, you get a lot of people to take a book. And then all of a sudden, someone gets the book and goes, oh my God, this is what I'm looking for. And in those days, in that mood, I don't know what they do now, in that mood, we would only spend two minutes with that person because that was, you know, what's the use of your... But that was the person that you should actually spend time with because they want to take the book. So the context was, you're talking to this guy at the end of this long conversation, he didn't even take a book. He didn't even chant Hare Krishna, so why did you waste your time? So, um, but if he gets a book, then he goes home with something tangible. That's what Prabhupada meant. But there were many people, sometimes they didn't have money, but, but you could see they were very interested and so I couldn't get them to take a book, but I got them to become a devotee or come to the temple or chant Hare Krishna. So it was, a, it was a context where, you know, you could go out all day and distribute three books, and the devotee next to you distributes 100. So then what happened to those other 97 people you spoke to? Oh, they're all really nice people, they're really interested, but then they have nothing and you don't know if you're going to see them. Now. Today is a little different because you can just give them a website and they can read a book on the website. So, you know, essentially, you, with, with one domain name, you can give everyone in the world a book. You know? So the world's changing. You, know? you have a, you know, one of those things where you, you tap from one phone to another and then it transfers information. So, you know, you could go on Sanger Time and say, you have a phone? You go, I just go, Doop. You got this share, you know, download this app, and knock your phone, and then. So, you know, and <laughs> essentially now you can give anybody a book, even if they don't have money, even if they're not interested. Right? Anyone with a phone. Okay. 
So going back to, to what, see there, there's two things that are going on here, it's very interesting. One thing is what Prabhupada's saying and how we're taking it, and the other thing that's what's actually going on on the ground. Because sometimes Prabhupada would say something and there'd be no feedback to what he said. It's just he said this and then everybody did it, but on the ground it may not be working. And if we had given feedback to Prabhupada, he may have said, well, in that case, then this. So a lot of people didn't want to come up with another conclusion, so they would allow things deteri to deteriorate in, because this is what Prabhupada said we should do. So that's one example of it. Um, and there are other things. So we have to use our intelligence also, and that's, I think, something we didn't do for a long time. So this is the instruction, just, just do it. But we have to see the result. Um, devotees were... Devotees went out on Sankirtan and Dodis. Uh, they would go into malls and the security would ask them to leave. And it was very easy to find them because they were wearing bright orange Dodis. So you could see that anywhere in the mall. So one devotee thought, well... The malls are such great places to distribute books. If we just wear normal clothes, then we just blend in. And one devotee said, yeah, but you got this big ponytail in the back of your head. So he said, okay, well, we'll get wigs. Then we'll just, we'll just look like anybody else. So they got some regular Western clothes. They bought some wigs. They went out. Excuse me, sir. As soon as they said, excuse me, sir, in a dhoti, everybody knew what they were. So most people would say, no, thank you. you know, it's something religious, I'm not interested. But as soon as you say, excuse me, sir, in regular clothes, people just stop because they think you want to know directions or the time. And then they're not intimidated by a shaved head and tilak and a dhoti, so they, they feel more comfortable just talking. You know, you're a regular person. So they started to distribute more books. It was an accident. It wasn't intentional. They just were protecting themselves from being seen by security. And then they realized that people felt more comfortable. Now, this became a big controversy in ISKCON. And you might, sitting here 50 years later, think, what's wrong with that? But that was never done before. So then that became a controversy. And then it was brought up to Prabhupada. And they're going back and forth. And you know what convinced Prabhupada? The argument that convinced him? The GBC of Los Angeles, who was the head of the BBT, said, Srila Prabhupada, we can wear dhotis, but if we do, book distribution will increase 50%. That was his... He wasn't saying that like we're threatening as a threat. He was just, that was factual. That we had increased book distribution 50% by not wearing dhotis. And Prabhupada said, in that case, dress like nice ladies and gentlemen, and it's fine. One devotee said, Prabhupada, if they're dressed this way, and people don't know they're devotees, now they're wearing wigs, you know, long hair, and it's, it's like, we're like karmis. So, that question you had, that Prabhupada was concerned. He didn't want us doing things that we used to do, like... Whenever a devotee had hair, he didn't like it. He said, why did you grow your hair? So he was concerned. We're going to wear Western clothes, you know, be, you know, we're just going to be like hippies and get long hair wigs or whatever, or grow our hair out or something. So the devotee said, no, they're dressed nicely like ladies and gentlemen. And he said, oh, then, then it's fine. So he was concerned that dressing that way could affect our consciousness. Now, I have some nuances to that story. 19, this was 1972 or 73, this big controversy came. And at that time, I had only distributed books in Dodi and Korcha, which I kind of liked because he, people knew who I was. So if they stopped, I thought, well, that's pretty good. They stopped. So I kind of liked it. But anyway, I distributed books in regular Western clothes. And then there was a group of us, and we thought, actually, 
if you have the right consciousness, it doesn't matter. You can wear, you can wear a dhoti and you can distribute just as many books. So we went out Christmas marathon and we distributed just as many books in dhotis and saris. And we wrote to Prabhupada and said, and we wanted to tell Prabhupada that this is an impurity, that you think you have to wear Western dress. You don't. We did it. And then we expected Prabhupada would then send that information around ISKCON because that's the way ISKCON uh, used to be. If something good happened, information would go around. So we thought, Prabhupada's going to tell everybody, just see, they distributed as many books as you did in Western dress in Dodi and Sari. But he didn't. And he wrote us back and said that if you like wearing a Dodi on Sankirtan, if you feel comfortable with that, that's fine. And that's all he said. He didn't say, you, you understood, I was only letting them wear those clothes. He just said, no, if you feel more comfortable, wear a dhoti. And that was all he said. So he didn't glorify us. We were very proud. He didn't, and he, that's why he only said one sentence. He just deflated us in one sentence. Oh, if you want to wear a dhoti, that's fine. Yes. Yeah. They also put on clothes. If yeah. I'm not entirely convinced, yeah. then it might be the Yeah, that's true. That has, that's true. You feel comfortable. Yeah. I've done both, so I can say that. But there still is the factor that in Western dress, it's easier to stop people. <laughs> Women in saris, they don't usually have such a problem. So, from my perspective on the ground, as a Sankirtan leader, even if Prabhupada said you could do something, but if that something was having a bad effect, it's better we don't do it, because it's having a bad effect on us, or it may have a bad effect on the public. But the other point I was making is that when you... It's just dangerous. It's just when you say it's okay to do this, where does it stop? If it's okay because you're a devotee, where does it end? So that was the other danger that we ran into. Because one devotee used to run red lights. And they tried to stop him. And he would say, well, it's just mundane law. And, and he would say, we're not under Kamsa's law. So, you know, it would lead to that. Let's read on. Those who act falsely in society lose their credibility and become the object of contempt. Cheating religion is also a serious sin. You know, ha, <laughs> ha. This pastor had a hidden earpiece. You couldn't see it. And people would come in and write down problems they had with their health or any problem they had. And then during the sermon, his wife would say, Elizabeth Smith, her husband is an alcoholic. And he would, then he would say, I feel there's somebody here named Elizabeth Smith and her husband has become an alcoholic and she's having difficulty and use that and to do that during the whole sermon. She'd just feed in information. He was finally caught. They finally caught him. In their shows of many, many, many pastors who are living a very high lifestyle, have their own private jets, drive very nice cars, live in very big mansions, who are intimidating people, basically that um, God won't like them if they don't give money. So, you know, one thing leads to another, leads to another. There's another story about lying 
is quite interesting. You may know the story that in Nabadweep there were devotees or so-called devotees who were claiming that was the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya and they established a temple there. Because if you have a temple of the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya, it's a good business because temples had become businesses. Right? So, of course, Bhaktivinoda Thakur Gorkhishar Babaji had proven that the Yoga Peet, the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya, was not over there. So there's, there's this idea that goes on in the temple business that if your temple is in a special place or your deity is special, like something special happens when you see that deity, more people will come and more people will give money. If you pray to this deity, he will fulfill your desire. If you're sick and you go to this temple, you'll get cured. Things like that. They have, you know, there's... Balaji, Tirupati, you go there, he'll fulfill your desire. So, you could call it a rumor, you could call it truth, but there's many temples with stories either about the location. This is the place, you know, in Satya Yuga, 28 zillion millenniums ago that a drop of hair, you know, perspiration from Varaha fell, you know, things like that, you know, and then they build the temple and people come and it's good for business. Whether it's true or not is another thing. You have to investigate. So one devotee knowing this said, Srila Prabhupada, I think it was in Juhu, why don't we say that if you, if you come to Rasa, Rasa Bihari temple, then you'll get this blessing or this benediction, you know, something material. You basically you make up a story about the deity. And you could say, well, anything's possible for Krishna, so it wouldn't be a story. It would, it would be true. And then Prabhupada, he didn't like that idea at all. There's no way he would do that. He never did that. And then he said that if you do that, then you allure people for the wrong reason. Then they're coming to Krishna consciousness to get something material. And that's why when people wanted Prabhupada to show some mystic power, he would never, even if he could, he wouldn't. Because he said, if I do, then they're coming for that reason. You know, if you show mystic power, you could get 100,000 people like overnight, maybe a million. Just do it on TV, pull the rascula out of your eye. And you're the next big guru in India, isn't it? Yeah, you know, big business. You know, if I got a nice turban, a nice dhoti, put on some interesting tea lock and got an advertising firm to promote me, I could, you know, be a big sensation in India. Right? If I do it, do it right, and I know how to speak well, a little flashy and, you know, get on TV, and a little clever, yeah. So Prabhupada wasn't like that. He didn't want to do that. He wanted us to succeed based on our purity. So you could relate that to book distribution also. You could relate that to anything. Cheating religion is also a serious sin. Those who decorate themselves externally with the signs of a pious person, such as tilak, mala, sacred thread, saffron, or white cloth, but have no internal devotion to the Lord are called religious pretenders. Those who carry out deceitful dealings with others or who smile while concealing their true intentions are called duplicitous. They are disregarded by all, by all as artful and cunning. Partiality means to support an unjust party for selfish reasons rather than supporting the righteous side. This type of conduct, conduct must be avoided. Mm. But then he has one more section on hypocrisy and, and these, are, these are principles, which you could say moral principles upon which to build the foundation of bhakti. Hypocrisy is a sin. We said cheating religion is a sin. Lying, uh, 
He didn't say lying is a sin. Hmm. Hypocrisy is a sin when a person out of habit or with self-interest acts deceitfully toward another, that is crooked dealings. When this insincere, deceitful nature becomes extreme, it becomes hypocrisy. A person who is addicted to this sin is a hypocrite or a pretender. Hmm. 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 Yeah, so this is interesting. That he, he, he's basically defining hypocrisy as a more serious form of uh, lying and it's actually considered a sin. So that would answer the question. If you do something sinful, does that affect your bhakti? Yeah. Definitely, right? Doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, so why don't we stop? Anyone have any questions or comments? Yes. You mentioned um, I think somebody else mentioned said something you said, oh that's that's relational. That's a different thing. But I was kind of thinking how that Devo it was re in relation to devotee relationships. Yeah. I was kind of thinking how that's kind of like at least from what I'm hearing, like you speaking, it's kinda of like the essence of it is actually like our our relationships but then also like relationships in the future. It's like for instance like going through this last like it's like you get killed over the Yeah. Things that hurt the, yeah. the devotees and the There was um, what what we learned is that you know you look at a situation you look at what are the benefits and what are the damages. And what we learned is whatever benefit we got from doing something that wasn't as straightforward as it should be, the the liabilities were many, many, many times greater. So then it, undermine, it undermines the... I always, I always thought that, you know, the prophet said purity is the force, and then um, people come to a society which should be pure. They expect it. So you, know, you have to be careful, even though you could philosophize and rationalize doing certain things which are considered maybe not 100% morally upright. If you wanted to do that, but why, in most cases, it would be counterproductive, unless it's involved in protecting people, or um, in holding back some major disaster. Like we said, uh, money, if someone's a drug dealer and they offer you money and you know that, you can't accept that because that's condoning their activity. But in rare cases, in extreme emergencies, where there would be a major disaster if that money was not available, you might accept it. And Prabhupada said that that's not a general rule, but sometimes it may happen. But you can't apply it as a general rule just because you did it in one situation. So it requires a little intelligence. It's a you know it's an interesting subject, and uh, requires a good brain to understand. But I think, I think, in retros, having experience of this, that every senior devotee would say, just everything should be straight. It's just, that's just the best way to do it. If, it's like Prabhupada said, if you want to lie, lie about Krishna, because it won't be a lie. Because whatever you say will be true, no matter how much you exaggerate. Yes? And, and the fear, it will awaken the back. 
feel like giving giving to the mind, sort of telling lies or expanding upon the truth is just because you're with your mind and your brain limited. Whereas if you're pure, even if you don't say anything, then uh, they can wake them up for the reason. Yeah. Has anyone ever lied to you? Yes. How did you feel? You, if you lose trust in someone, then you don't yeah. trust them. Yeah. Hmm. Now, you want to get transcendental? Okay, here's the transcendental perspective. What is real and what is truthful? <laughs> Krishna. So when, you, you know, on the absolute platform, when you talk about honesty and truthfulness, it means you're talking about the soul and Krishna, because that's what's true. And everything else is what? Asat. It's unreal. Everything material is unreal. <coughs> so sometimes devotees say, we have to be real. So we understand what they mean. We have to act according to our nature. It can't be artificial. But at the same time, what does real mean? Real means Krishna and Krishna consciousness and the soul. So you want to get real, become self-realized. That's how you get real. So sometimes Prabhupada would use those definitions. And then if you're, if you're doing that, he would say, then, you know, if you're giving people Krishna, you're always honest. And in, from that point of view, if you're not giving people Krishna, then you're not honest. Even if you are honest. But, so that's philosophically true, but sometimes would get us into trouble because we wouldn't apply it properly. Is that okay? Are you more confused than when you came in, or what? <laughs> Better off or worse off? Better off. Yes? Yeah. To, um, to, to, for instance, like, say, save somebody, you might feel like someone is like, wants to do something to hurt themselves, and you might feel like somehow different. Well, well, one example was, we give someone a book, and they'd say, is this religious? And we'd say, no. This throws out religion. This book throws out religion. Because <laughs> that's the second verse of the Bhagavatam. <laughs> it kicks out all cheating religion. <laughs> so, if we say it's not religious, we mean it's a spiritual book. But when they ask the question, is it religious, we kind of know what they mean. Is it a book about God? And so yeah, it's a book about God, but we don't see it as religious, as a relig ritualistic book like a, a Bible or, 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 or a similar religion. So that would be an example. Because you can tell that this person is spiritual but they don't like religion, and you know if they read the book, they'll like it. So I just want to tell them, no, it's not religious, it's spiritual. And then they read the book, and they like it. And I don't want to deprive them of the opportunity by saying, yes, it's religious, and it's spiritual. No, it's not religious, it's spiritual. There's no religious rituals described in this book. It's not a book on religion. Yeah. So out of compassion and concern to help somebody you might say something like so that was it's just you have to draw the line otherwise where does it end and you know the possibility that someone who becomes religious can become more degraded than someone who's not because they misuse their right to do whatever they want to do because they're serving God. So then it becomes dangerous. Right? Yes? What? Everything has its time, place, and circumstance. 
Depends how it's used. Because everything can be misunderstood. I mean, in general, yeah, that's true. We were discussing that today at the meetings, that something works within a context, and the same thing doesn't work in another context. So situation changed, then you find Prabhupada just said something different than he said three years ago. Because situation had changed, or he's dealing with a different devotee, so it's a different context, so a different statement. So if you know how to apply that, it works. If you take advantage of it, then you, you may do something wrong in the name of time, place, circumstance. And there may be principles that are eternal, that every time, place, and circumstance they're meant to happen. And then if you misuse that statement, then you could change them. That would be bad. Well, it's Kali Yuga, it's, you know, 50 years after Prabhupada came, so, you know, who can chant 16 rounds? It's too hard. And now everybody's living outside the temple, so, you know, we'll just make it four. That would be misuse. Is that okay? Integrity in relation to devotee relationships. She has a question, or she wants to ask a question, or she wants me to talk about Well, one of the things we've seen that relates to a lack of integrity and to time, place, and circumstances is a devotee gets a position and he misuses that and he treats people under him unkindly because he's in charge or she's in charge. More a he than a she, generally. So I have a position, therefore I think I have a right to... You know the word bully? You have a word for bully? Big bully. Yeah. Just, just push you around. I have a right to push you around without consideration without considering how you feel and how it affects you. See, we had defined in the first class, we had defined integrity as a unity between what you believe and how you act. So we believe in humility, we believe in service. We believe in kindness, we believe in compassion. If I get power, I misuse that power so I'm not so kind, and I think I'm the boss, not the servant, that becomes a lack of integrity. Because I believe in humility, but I'm not acting humble. And now this, this, the excuse is, the circumstance is different. I'm in charge and you're supposed to follow me. Mm 